entire world is constantly evolving. As time moves forward, things change, which is why it's important to stay informed. Throughout the year, there are dozens of professionals that share their expertise with the community through lectures sponsored by local government agencies and area not-for-profits. And each month, SLC TV will feature one of these visiting professors as they discuss the latest current events. So grab a notebook and pull up a chair, because the lecture hall is about to begin. So I've been working with bats for a long time. Back in 1998-99, uh, we used to have bats in the Met Stadium in St. Lucie County. I know some of the kids that are in here, that was like way before your time. But for some of us, and actually it was probably before a lot of our time here because we do have so many people moving to our community. But back then we had an issue with bats in the stadium. And I've always kind of helped people with bats in buildings. You know, sometimes bats here in St. Lucie County, they like to get in those barrel tiled roofs that are not sealed properly. And they live in there and sometimes that can cause a health problem with guano and things like that. And uh, on occasion we have them in places that are going to be a pretty severe public nuisance. Sometimes medical buildings will have them, and sometimes we'll get them like in the stadium in St. Lucie West where the Mets were. And back in 98, 99, I think it was 99, they were actually going to stop spring training from starting up because the bats were living over the bleachers, over, over the seating, and it was a health concern. So they called me in real fast, and what we did is we had a prescription for something called bat exclusion. So basically we put one-way doors up so the bats were able to get out but not get back in again, and we put up a bat house to serve as alternative habitat. So I'll kind of talk about that during my presentation today. And we also have an abundance of bat roosts in St. Lucie County. I'm gonna show you one of the bridges uh, one of my, two of my students were working on. Uh, they did a survey of bridges in St. Lucie County looking for bats. So we'll kind of talk about all that stuff. So today we're gonna to talk about some bat biology, some common um, bat species that are found here, some bat folklore, some conflicts between bats and people, vampire bats. I've actually worked with vampire bats, not here, but down in Costa Rica, and then bat detectors and echolocation. And um, I'm going to concentrate on that last portion there. So some of the misconceptions, bats don't want to fly in your hair. You know, that's one of the misconceptions. People tell me that bats will buzz them. Well, if you're going out right after dusk or maybe right before dawn, if you've got a lot of bats in the area, they might come down and kind of maybe swoop near you, but it's not, they're not attracted to you in any way, shape, or form. So they're not gonna be out there, you know, trying to attack you or whatever it is that people think. Um, they don't wanna butt your neck. So, so don't think that you're gonna have a bat fall down and like going, you know, that's all Dracula movies. That's, that's not reality here. Uh, they won't eat their fruit off of your trees. Sometimes people think that the bats in Florida, we've got, we don't have the fruit eating bats here. One of the other things, we obviously we don't have vampire bats. They're also, this is a big misconception, they're not mosquito eaters. So the bats that we have in St. Lucie County, although they are insect eaters, they are not what I would consider to be voracious mosquito eaters. So if you put a bat house up in your backyard because of mosquito control, you wanna have them eat the mosquitoes, it's probably not gonna do a lot of work, you know, a good job of, of putting those mosquitoes down. Uh, what they're going to do, though, is they're going to eat moths and some other insects that are flying around back there. When you get up towards Orlando and you get the little brown bat, that's when you start getting those voracious mosquito eaters. So as you move down the peninsula, the bat species change a little bit. And down here, uh, we have the Brazilian freetail bat, which is just not a mosquito eater. And then uh, they are not blind, but they navigate, they fly around and navigate using echolocation. And I have some devices in the room that's, that can pick up the echolocation. We can't hear it, but we need devices that can. So the thing about rabies, people are also concerned about the health risks associated with rabies. So less than, it's, it's less than, it's one in 200 people, uh, one, less than one in 200 bats in a population could potentially be rabid at any time. Now, that's, believe it or not, that sounds like a low amount, but that's what statistics show. And when you have a bat colony that might be in the numbers of hundreds of thousands, you can see where you can be dealing with quite a few bats that could be rabid. Now, especially for kids what, and, and for pets, when you ever see a bat that's kind of off on its own, it might be clinging to a window or maybe clinging to a wall or something all on its own, or maybe down on the ground, 
that's an indication that there's something not quite right with that bat. Now, bats are colonial, which means that they like to live with other bats. So they're going to be up in a roost somewhere. Sometimes they're in an attic, sometimes they're in a palm tree or something. But when you start seeing them on their own, it's an indication that something's not wrong, and potentially they could be rabid. And what happens when they do pick up the rabies virus is they start to lose muscle tone, they, they get malnourished, they stop eating, they lose muscle tone, and they move from the roost down lower to the ground. And that's when children and pets can potentially be exposed to that. Uh, we did have an instance at one of our local environmental education centers where one of the junior volunteers at the center saw a bat, he was with some friends on a trail, saw a bat and put the bat in a shoebox, brought it home for a few days, and then I kind of found out about it through the word, you know, through word of mouth, and that's when we determined that it would be a good idea for the health department to get involved because we just don't know if that child was exposed to any viruses. And just to show you in comparison, raccoons, it's about one in three. Statistics show about one in three raccoons could be rabid at a, at a given time, statistically. So there are two suborders. There's the new world bat, which is the microchiroptera. This bat that I have right here is one of the micro bats. I know it might look large, but when you um, are out there in the wild, we just don't have those flying foxes. Now, I've been to parts of the world where they do have flying foxes. You can go to Australia, New Zealand, places like that, and they have giant flying foxes that are, you know, an arm's length ahead. If you ever go, if you ever get a chance to go to some place like Sydney, Her Royal Majesty's Botanical Garden in downtown Sydney has sausage, sausage trees, and they look like, the fruit look like giant sausages. There are flying foxes by the hundreds living in those. We just don't have them here. If you go to a zoo and they have the giant flying foxes, just keep in mind that those came from somewhere else. It's kind of a misconception when people think about bats that they think about these gigantic you know, things and, and also the vampire bats from the movies and things like that. So all of our bats are going to be somewhat small like this. And this is actually on the larger end of the bat species that we've got. We've got one that's actually the size of the top digit of my thumb. So they're, they're tiny. It's almost like a double bubble bee. It's, it looks like it's about that big, wingspan about that big. And, and those giant um, flying foxes are the fruit-eating bats, and we call those megachiroptera. Now, what chiroptera means, it means hand wing. So, and micro meaning small, mega meaning large. So if you look at a bat's wing, if you were to stretch it out, spread it out, you would see that it has the finger bones, the same finger bones that we have. Their thumb is actually the tip where the wing would connect and it would go around the membranes. Uh, the thumb is not an opposable thumb like ours. We can wiggle and move our thumb around. It's very stiff and I would, I would call it a semi-opposable. So it just kind of moves like this. It would be good to cling on to something, but not really you know, as, as usable as ours. So uh, we have 13 native species in Florida and they're mostly insectivorous. Uh, we do have seven that are advantageous, which means that they came here from somewhere else, and then they're likely to migrate out. Bats are, of course, preyed on by other critters. Snakes will prey on them. If you ever go out to the bat cave out in Texas, that I'm sure you're, you've heard about in Austin, uh, they actually have owls, and they've got snakes and things like that, just kind of waiting there and perching, waiting for the, the bats to come out at night. Uh, with owls, what I've noticed is we'll do night hikes from time to time, and I've done this with the Manatee Center, and April, maybe we can do this next year. So where we've done night hikes, and what we'll notice is that the bats, if there's a gap in the forest, the bats will just kind of congregate along the edge of the forest, and if you look real closely at the forest edge, you'll see owl eyes staring back at you. And that's because the, the, the owls are waiting for all the bats to kind of accumulate, and what they'll do is they'll make a mad break for it across the gap, and that's when the owls kind of strike and eat their, their prey. So this is a free tail bat. This is what I've got here. And you can tell it's a free tail bat because the tail is hanging free. Now the membrane from the other, for the other bats in Florida, especially in our area, the tail, um, the membrane goes all the way to the tip of the tail. But just here, we, we just don't have the type that, um, we, we've got the free tail that has the, this is the most common one, by the way, that has a tail that does not have the membrane about it. Uh, 
Cynocephala, cephala, and what that basically, that's the genus and species, and that's the subspecies right there. And by the way, there's a Mexican free tail and there's a Brazilian free tail. There are two different types of bats. We've got the Brazilian. And the cynocephala, what that is, that translates into dog head. So if you have a good imagination, you can kind of see a dog's head in the face of that bat. You'll also notice that the ears are somewhat facing forward, and you might notice that there's a lot of wrinkles in their face. And we think that all those adaptations is to help them pick up sound waves out in the environment. So free-tailed bats, they mate in about mid-February to about late March. They um, will have, um, she'll be pregnant with them for about 12 weeks, and then the female gives birth. When she gives birth, she's upside down. So what'll happen is she'll go back to the bat colony, back to the roost, she'll hang upside down, and that little baby bat will come out of her womb, and then will cling to the fur, and during the first few minutes, they smell each other. And the mama bat really gets a good chance to recognize her baby bat that way, and the, the mama bat will, of course, produce milk for, for the baby. But then the mama gets hungry, and the mama has to go out looking for insects to eat. So what the mama will do is the mama will move the baby bat with the other baby bats in the colony, and then she'll fly off, she'll lead her insects at night, and then she'll go back and she'll find her baby bat and what might be hundreds of others. And they do that by recognizing the scent. And they, they imprint that way. Have you ever heard about birds and how birds imprint when you've got little hatchlings? They imprint on the, on the adult really quickly. Well, it's somewhat like that with the bats. Now, some people have problems with bats in the buildings. So sometimes here in St. Lucie County, we'll have bats that get up in the barrel tile roofs and are not properly sealed. They live up there, and I'll have a slide a little bit later that shows this. The prescription for dealing with that is by putting up one-way doors. So essentially the bats are able to get out but not get back in again. It's called exclusion. Well, if you were to have the mama bat leave the colony but not get back in again, then all the babies are going to die off because they can't feed. So during certain times of the year, in the summertime primarily, the, the mom, it's technically illegal to do that exclusion process. You have to wait until the babies are, long, are old enough uh, to be able to fly out of that bat colony and, and be able to get insects on their own. So there's an actual season for it. So this is the, the free tail bat. They're brown. They're well camouflaged out there for night flying. Uh, I've worked with my bat detectors, and I've had bats right there. My bat detectors say that they're close by. I've never seen them out there. Uh, we've gone out to bat houses. We've looked in the bat houses in St. Lucie County. We've actually seen flying foxes in some but we've never actually seen the bats clinging to the bat houses out there. And that's because they're very well camouflaged and also they just don't like using bat houses in our area. So this is one, uh, an attic that has bats in it and you can see how they're just kind of clinging to the edge right there and they're kind of clinging to the peak. If a bat gets into attics, what happens, you're, you're not gonna have one, you're not gonna have two, you're gonna have a whole colony probably. And what happens is they look for a little exposed entryway and they get up in there. And it might take just an inch of a crack in the roof for the bats to be able to get in there. And they'll make that into a colony. And you can usually identify where they're coming in and out because of the smell. And it's the guano. What happens is they, they come out of that roost area. You'll see the, the body oils will start rubbing off on the wood on the roof. So you'll notice a discoloration in the wood. And as they fly off, they will expel their waste. And they do that to go ahead and lighten the load, basically. It's easier for them to fly without all the stuff in their innards than it is for them to fly out with a full gut. So they, they will expel all their, their guano, and then they'll fly off and start looking for insects again. So this is what the barrel tiles generally look like on roofs. And to a bat, that is like a bat house. I would love to see some, maybe we have scout leaders or homeschoolers or something that might want to do this. I would love to see somebody in St. Lucie County actually do an experiment with this. Find a nice nature preserve somewhere in St. Lucie County. We've got a lot. Maybe um, Amanda Thompson or somebody at, the, at St. Lucie County might be willing to work with you on this. And just get a one square yard piece of wood and then attach some barrel tiles to it and then put it up in the air so it's about 13 feet off the ground and then pitch it at an angle like this facing eastward. And we'll just see if the bat's actually like living at a bat house that's just made out of barrel tiles. What happens is they get into the bottom. If you've ever seen them, there's a little air, um, a little joint right down at the bottom, a little air hole. 
and the bats kind of squeeze in there when they're not properly um, sealed. And in the morning, they will go up to the top where it starts to warm up. So in the morning, they're gonna be up at the top where it's warmer first. And then as it gets too warm out, they slowly start moving down the barrel tile. And then at about dusk, they wait for about half an hour after dusk. And that's when they all start coming out. And of course, they like this because we don't have caves, do we? When was the last time we were in a cave in St. Lucie County? Never, never. So this is uh, the Florida bonneted bat. And this is our largest resident bat. It's also federally endangered. Now, all bats are protected. They're protected not as endangered species. This particular one is. You just have to make sure that you're humanely working with bats. So you can't kill them. You can't spray them with insecticides and all that other stuff. Believe me, I've heard stories over the years of what people do to wildlife. Um, the worst stories, of course, are snake stories. People always email me snake pictures with the head cut off. What is this? I tell them it's a dead snake. <laughs> you know, email me before you chop the head off. But uh, so, you know, just kind of keep in mind that they are federally protected. They are protected. Um, state law says you can't be cruel to them. So if you have them in buildings and you need to exclude them, you need to be able to do that safely. And I would recommend that you hire somebody that's got expertise in that. This is an evening bat. You kind of see how they're all kind of close together like that. They are colonial, so they all will kind of pile on. They like to kind of touch each other and kind of pile onto each other. And what I've noticed in the bat colonies here, they like to be in areas that have a loud, constant noise production. And where I've seen a lot of them are underneath the highway turnpike and I-95 overpasses. If you go down, this is my secret bat roost. It's only on TV and I'm only telling about 40, 30 people in the room. My favorite bat roost in St. Lucie County is completely open to everybody. You go down Angle Road to where the turnpike and um, I-95 go over. There's two highway overpasses. And you just stand there and you'll hear all the bats. Hundreds of thousands of bats living in each of those overpasses. You'll smell them. The one thing I don't want you to do, I don't want you to look up with your mouth open. <laughs> Why? Yeah, obviously, is, you know, there's a lot of guano down there. And I've had students studying that, those bat colonies for a while. I also don't mind telling people about those bat colonies because it's, not, it's easy for people to see them. They're living in the cracks up there. It's easy to see, to see the, the guano, but it's fenced off, so it's not easy for people to actually get to it. So these are evening bats, and they are all colonial like that. There's one species uh, that's not, but for the most part, they are. So the cave roosting bats, we've got the myotis bat, the gray bat, the tricolor bat. Um, they used to be called eastern pipistrelle. The eastern pipistrelle is our smallest bat. The body is about the size of my, the top digit of my thumb. So when you spread the wings out, they're like the size, almost like the size of a double bumblebee. So if you were out there seeing them flying around in the evening, you might actually mistake them for something else. You know, it's really easy to mistake some of these bats for something else. So, and of course, these are living up in the panhandle. And by the way, let's just kind of recognize what happened up in the panhandle this week. I mean, you know, we've all survived hurricanes for a very long time. I've been here since the 80s. And we usually get a lot of warning from the NOAA when hurricanes are coming. They got like two days. And they had almost a Hurricane 5 hit them. We've never had that happen here in St. Lucie County that I'm aware of. But if you think about it, they wouldn't have even had time to put the shutters up. You know, it happened that quickly. So we'll kind of keep them in our minds through this. So, um, and you can see in this picture where that thumb bone is. So it's not a thumb that's jointed like this. It kind of moves stiffly like this. And you can also see the thumb with the membrane going around the finger bones. And of course, the membrane would go all the way down to the tail. They're true flying mammals. So we have some in, in Florida. We've got the flying, um, um, the flying squirrels. Those flying squirrels that are flying around out there, they're actually gliders. And if you go to White City Park at the right time, you might actually see some of them flying between some of the palm trees out there. I've seen them at the Oxbow Eco Center. There's a bat house on the Oxbow Eco Center property, and we've never had bats in it, but I've seen flying squirrels up in there. Um, we've taken our, our searchlights up there and seen them. So in caves, what they do up in the panhandle, when they've got, because they have caves up there. We don't have them down here, but they have them up there. They will actually block people from going into the caves. 
And they do that because they don't want those, those colonies disturbed, especially in the wintertime. Uh, and then they'll post signs up there, do not enter the bat cave. So you see this tricolored bat. What happens is as wintertime approaches, they will start building up their, their storage of body fat. And there's not a lot of them on, there's not a lot of fat on a bat. Not a lot of fat on a bat. That could be a song, couldn't it? <laughs> not a lot of fat on a bat. And so there's not a lot. So what, but they do hibernate. So what they'll do is they'll get into those caves, and then their body temperature will slowly lower, and they'll get to about the ambient temperature of the environment around them. And they've actually, I've seen video where they've had thermal cameras in caves. So you'll see that there are bats on the cave wall, exactly the same temperature of the wall of the cave itself. And it might be, you see there's, there's actual um, frost on that bat. But if people go into the colony, it might be just enough to wake the bat up. And if they do that in the middle of the winter, they do not have enough fat storage in their bodies to make it through the, to the end of the winter when they would normally come out of their hibernation. So they might wake up in the middle of winter and then die before the end of the winter occurs. They would all freeze to death. So that's why they have to have those bat colonies up in the cave areas of Florida where they have to actually stop people from going in there. Here in St. Lucie County, where are they living in nature? In, in, outside of the buildings that we've talked about, where would bats be living here? Palm trees. palm trees. We actually have the yellow bat, which likes to live in palm trees. And there's actually a lot of stuff going on in palm trees. Uh, when you've got those dead, the palm fronds that die off and kind of hang down, I love it when people leave some of those because it actually is a lot of habitat for a lot of birds. The bats like to get up in there. The yellow bat is almost perfectly camouflaged on those dead palm fronds. So it's a lot of habitat when you leave those dead palm fronds. It also makes sure that the tree is healthy. When you cut those palm fronds off, sometimes you open up wounds that allow bacteria and things to get in. So I usually let, I ask people to leave them. So some of the tree roosting bats, we've got red bats, the seminal bat, that yellow bat's the one I just talked about, and then the hoary bat, and that one looks like it almost has a little beard on it. And uh, this is what a seminal bat looks like. They live in Spanish moss. So when you see the Talansius, the Spanish moss, living in those oak trees, sometimes you'll see them living right in that Spanish moss. This is the yellow bat, and it's actually on a, a little bit of Spanish moss right there. They like to live in those palm fronds, and you see that, that yellowish color to its fur? It's almost perfectly camouflaged. Every time somebody um, has ever contacted me about the yellow bats, it's been landscapers that have been trimming the palm fronds, and they disturb a colony of bats, and they want to know what to do. And I usually just tell them, just leave the palm fronds. <laughs> it's easy. Just leave the palm fronds. Uh, that hoary bat, you kind of see where it looks like it maybe has a crest on its chest right there. Um, they live in Florida only in the spring and fall, and then they migrate throughout the state, through, through the state, and then they leave. So this is what it would look like if you have them living in your building. So you see how they've kind of gotten into the soffits or you know, maybe where a little air vent might be on the side of the house. If all it takes like an inch and the bats are getting in there, and my little pointer doesn't show that it doesn't work here, but you kind of see where it's marked with a little bit of a discoloration, that's the body oils. As, as you have hundreds of bats coming out of a colony, they just kind of rub against that, that wood and over time, it just kind of stains the wood. Now, my experience is they like loud, constant noises. I mentioned the highway overpasses. They're getting a lot of noise from the roads that are overhead. In buildings, I've noticed that they like to be around pool pumps or air conditioners. They have a loud, constant hum. And every time, well, not every time, but a lot of the times I've been working with bats where they've been on the eastern side of the building and they have you know, a loud air conditioner or something. And the exclusion process is what they're showing up here. So it's basically putting in one-way doors, and there's a, a number of different ways to do that. You can put mesh up over the bat entrance so the bats are not able to get back in it, but you have to be careful with how you do that. Uh, there's something called the Hanks funnel. So you can actually form a tube out of hardware cloth and create a little tunnel that's about two inches in diameter so the bats can kind of get out there and then fly away. If you were to do like what's shown in that picture, you can leave a buckle, leave a little bit of a ripple in that, in, that, um, in that material so the bats can climb out but they can't get back in again. And of course you can't do it uh, August 15th, or yeah, between 
April 15th and August 15th, you can't do it during that, that time because that's when all the babies are in there and you would actually kill hundreds of bats inadvertently. So um, we did this at the Met Stadium and we thought we did everything proper. You know, we, we put up the excluders, we hired somebody to come out and get way up high. I'm not a heights person, so they hired somebody to get out there. And then the folks at the Road and Bridge Department with the county built a bat house and they put it on four poles and they put it out at the Mets Colony. I even went out there with my bat detectors. I located the source of water that I thought they were most likely to be going towards to get insects. And we thought we had everything all set and the bats never came. <laughs> so we were able to get them safely out of the stadium. So that's why we still have the Mets here, the spring training, it never ended, you know, because we, could, we were gonna lose the Mets. And, um, uh, but they never did come to the bat house. And back in 2004 with the hurricane season, the bat house just kind of fell over on its side. So it's probably just rotting out there. It's probably unusable and, and certainly it'll be difficult to put it back up. They went so far as to put bleachers up. We were gonna simulate what they have in Gainesville at the bat house. We just never had luck with them. We think they moved into the highway overpasses though. And this is what it looked like. So they were living over the seats. So, you know, obviously there's a health issue there. You wouldn't want people sitting underneath where, especially at nighttime, if there's a night game, game going on, where the bats come out and of course they're expelling their waste. You wouldn't want that, yes? Um, was, was the stadium and all of that after removing the bats, how did they keep the bats from coming out? Well, the nice thing about doing this, you know, I had that, the, hard, the screen, the hardware cloth and all that, you can just leave it there. So it's a permanent fixture at the, at the Met Stadium. If you were, and I should probably actually go there and kind of remind people that there's a reason why these, these contraptions are up there because you know over time people forget and you don't want to have the screens taken out and just to have the bats go back in again. So I probably should go out there and kind of remind them because it's been almost 20 years since we did that. And, uh, and this is what they were living in, that little expansion joint and they were over all the seats out there. So they just put some, um, and that's what the guano looked like. And it wasn't just a little bit, it was a lot. And yeah, I'll talk about that because I've got the, the statistics on that. Um, and then you can see this is an excluder. So the bats were all able to get out safely but not get back into those expansion joints. So we just had a lot of bats flying around and we did our best to put a bat house up. They just didn't come, you know. It's like the Manatee Center. You put the Manatee Center next to the, the creek and you kind of hope that they're gonna come. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. So this is the bat house that they built and it was kind of interesting because I had no idea when I was getting roped into doing this project that it was gonna be like as big of a news story as it was, but I had Time Magazine. I had, they had me crawl. You see where that little X is with that bar? They had me climb up, they got ladders and had me climb up to that little, so I was straddling that, that bar right there for hours as, as they were out there taking pictures of me doing all this. And then I had the news stationed outside my house for, for a day. They liked the, the baseball bat and they liked the flying bat. So that was newsworthy right there enough to make news. Uh, so somewhere in Time Magazine that was in there. Uh, I also worked with Windmill Point Elementary School, and this is what the excluder looked like here. But the unusual thing about this is it was on the artificial wall, the, the brick fascia. So when you're at that school, you might notice that you've got the wall, and then they've got these places where they've got this brick fascia, it's an artificial, kind of like it just gives an appearance to the wall. There was a one inch gap behind it. The thing that I didn't have in this picture is the air conditioner for the whole school was right there also. So once again, the loud, constant noise the bats got in to that little crack and they went down. So usually I'm used to bats going up into things. In this case, they went down into that little crack. So the way we solved that issue was by putting that, that excluder up and the bat problem was solved. And of course, that was another safety issue because you don't want you know, how many hundreds of kids in that school, we don't want them going around bats. And we saw the statistics on rabies. So one bat in 200 could have that disease. So certainly we, we don't want them around kids which is one of the reasons I don't have them as pets. So sometimes you might go to presentations where they have live bats. I've worked with Cindy Marks with the Florida Bat Center. Uh, she's over in Pinellas County. She has live bats that she's re rehabilitated. So somebody might have an injured bat that's been brought to her. They might have baby bats that have been brought to her. She's gotta feed these bats by hand. 
And not only that, she has to do that every day. And she's got, sometimes she's got to be up around the clock feeding these babies and things. So, uh, and, and she's also gone tone deaf in high frequencies. So high frequency pitches, and I think it's just from being around so many bats in her house that she, and one bat has the same, uh, their echolocation is about as loud as a lawnmower would be. It's just that it's in a frequency that we cannot hear. So this is a vampire bat, and that's me holding a vampire bat. So back in 1999, I was working on my master's degree, and um, by the way, I was here at the time. It's possible to live here and go to school here, by the way. I grew up in Fort Pierce. I, I, grew up, I went to Fort Pierce Central High School, the old one that was on Edwards Road. It's now a Taj Mahal. It's wonderful. They've got a culinary school and everything on 25th Street. Bat Colony is right there on 25th Street, by the way. I didn't tell anybody in the room there. And um, so I went to school there, and then I went to IRSC, went off to UCF to get my teaching degree, taught for a year, decided I wanted to remain sane, got my job, <laughs> got my job at the University of Florida, and I've been doing this stuff ever since. And, and during that time, I earned my master's degree right at UF, right here by Hylai. And I have an agricultural education degree, and I also have a, master, um, a graduate certificate in environmental education. And as part of that, I went down to Costa Rica, and I studied the relationship between vampire bats and cattle. So what we were doing is we were putting out mist nets out in the forest, and what mist nets, it's, it's kind of like a tangle net, and they're very delicate. So what we would do is we would set them up in the forest in Costa Rica, and we would spread them out. We would look at the cattle in the field and just, just kind of take a survey of them there. And then we would open the nets up, and we would have a timer, and as scientists, we measure everything, and we have net time of about 15 minutes. So after 15 minutes of timing, we would close the nets up, and then we would go down, and we would pick all the bats out that we caught during the night. And sure enough, we were finding vampire bats. And they're called phylostomus, and what that means, phylostomus is leaf nose. So there are many different types of phylostomus bat, and that's that leaf that kind of goes over the nostrils. So this is a particular species called Desmos rotundus, and what we were finding that they would do is they would just pick on maybe a few cattle out in a field, or maybe a horse. So they would get out there and they would kind of mostly concentrate their efforts. They would fly one at a time onto the animal, and, or maybe even a couple at a time, and I think they were sensing the blood meal. I think they were smelling it, but I'm not sure. They would get out there and they would make a near-perfect surgical incision with their teeth, and then what they would do is they would start salivating. And as they lapped it up, their saliva would anticoagulate. It would not allow the, bl the blood to clot. And almost immediately what was happening is the bat, as it was drinking that blood meal, it was expelling the liquid. So just keep in mind, a bat needs to be very efficient to fly. The water weight is just unnecessary weight. It was looking for the protein in the blood meal. So as it was lapping, it was instantaneously peeing it out. And then they would get so heavy from the, the protein that they would take that they would drop to the ground and they would bend their wings like this and hop over to a place to kind of hide. They would digest the blood meal and then maybe an hour or two later they would go back to the roost or maybe even go out looking for another blood meal. You, we could always find the, the animals that were the prey animals for the vampire bats because they were the sickliest. And you could actually see the staining on the hide. You could see like where the fur had been stained from the blood meal. Um, and then they would get all the diseases from it and so forth. So, yeah, so they're real. My colleague Bill Kern with the University of Florida had to go back to that area of the world. He studied vampire bats. He had to go back to that area because sometimes people live in houses that don't have windows that close. They might be open. And there were actually kids that were getting bit at night by the vampire bats. So at that point, when there's a human health issue, they had to actually take care of that issue that way. Uh, so these are bat detectors. I actually have them here. And you can go and use a search engine. You can go online and look for bat detectors. This one run, runs about $89. This one runs about $500. They go up from here. There are some that are about $2,000. And then as you get more scientific, you can run $5,000. They also have devices out there that you can clip onto your iPhones. And I've heard that they do work pretty good. And there's some software out there. So I have not personally tried it. So buyer beware, you know. These do work pretty well. And the reason we use them, these bat detectors, is because the bats, they're mostly nocturnal. So like I said earlier, one of the misconceptions is that they're blind. They're not blind. They can actually see. 
They just prefer to be active at night here in St. Lucie County. And in order for them to navigate around, they have to echolocate. So just like dolphins use sound sonar, bats use echolocation. They put out the sound waves. And then you can see in this diagram, they're giving out the sound waves and then they're actually listening for what the sound wave bounces back to them. And there are a few different types of sounds that they put out. There's a search phase, and you might have heard what it was like, boom, 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 boom. It, almost like maybe um, a mallet hitting metal or something like that. That is the search phase. So they'll put out that long frequency, um, high frequency pitch sound. We can't hear it, by the way. It's above our range of being able to hear it. You can actually feel the vibrations when there's enough of them around, though. So they've got that search phase when they're out there. When they think they found a, a something for them to eat, they've got that approach phase. So let's say that they've sensed through their echolocation that there might be a moth or a dragonfly or something out there that they want to eat. What they'll do is they'll go from search phase to approach phase. So it goes from boom, boom, to boom, boom, boom. It just kind of speeds it up. And then finally, when they get to that terminal phase, that's the raspberry phase. Who knows what a raspberry, you know? Yeah, that's the raise. I've never heard raspberries, and I never heard it called that. We used to call it, you know, something else. But um, so they call it the raspberry noise. And um, so when the bats are echolocating out there, they'll do that search phase, and then they'll do the approach phase when they're getting close to it. And then when they're just about ready to eat that insect, they'll, they'll raspberry. So it's always kind of interesting. What we'll do is we'll, we'll listen to the, for the raspberries on our audio. And if you ever wanted to listen, I've got a whole bunch. Um, I've got this link up here. This is not mine, it's Smithsonian's. And there are a whole bunch of different bat echolocation calls up there. So if you wanted to see what it looks like, this is what a typical, um, um, the sound would look like for the big brown bat. We don't have them, Orlando, we would have them. But you kind of see where they're up in kilohertz at about 60 to about 30 kilohertz. And they have that sound like that. Um, our bats here in St. Lucie County, if we were to use this, we can modulate the frequency. We can also um, increase the sound. When I'm doing groups of 30 people on a night hike or something, I will actually hook them up to external speakers so everybody hears them. And um, we actually have to go down a little bit in frequency. So we would never in St. Lucie County find bats up at 60 kilohertz up there. We have to go down to about 20 to 30 kilohertz. And that's just because of the kind of bat that we have here. There are plenty of resources out there. This website, I'm not gonna click on this, but this website is a place where you can actually get um, the frequencies. So what somebody has done, uh, Sonobat, whoever that is, what Sonobat has done is they published this research that they've gone out there and they've um, recorded echolocation and then they've matched that up with the frequency that's being put out and they've also matched that up with the bat that they have out there. So uh, here in St. Lucie County, I just have the experience knowing that we probably have free tail bats flying around. So I know that we've got them around 20 kilohertz to about 30 kilohertz. And that would match up with the information on that as well. So if you're ever out in Georgia or Virginia or someplace like that, and you're using a bat detector like this, and you hear bats echolocating at about 50 kilohertz, you can go to this website, this document, and you can find your general area and you can see, oh yeah, if it's micro, if it's, if it's got echolocation at about 50 kilohertz, it's probably this bat right here. So that's how you can match that up. So I had a student, I teach the Florida Master Naturalist Program. You can see it on my shirt. I'm a walking billboard for it. And at the University of Florida, we have the Master Naturalist Program. I also work with Amanda Thompson and Ren Underwood who are with Environmental Resource Department with St. Lucie County, and we teach these Florida Master Naturalist programs. And we have students that have to take on final projects. And I always get really charged up, really energized on the students that take my projects, you know, because my, they're always, either I'm gonna have somebody out there wrangling pythons in the Everglades, I, which by the way, I have had them doing that, or they're gonna be out there for a final project working on bats or something. Uh, but you see that staining? That is the bat guano. That's the back guano. So they found the bats in those two bridges, and then they found one more bridge in St. Lucie, um, uh, over off of 25th Street, St. James. It's near Fort Pierce Central High School. 
And you might not even realize you're going over a bridge, but it's there. If you're ever kayaking on the St. Lucie River, you go underneath that, the St. Lucie River, right underneath 25th Street right there, don't ever open your mouth and look up at the same time because there are a lot of bats down there. And it looks somewhat like this. So that's standing. So then they were saying, okay, so we did this bat survey and we found the bats in these bridges, so now what? They were really ambitious. They were only with me for like six weeks doing all this work. So what they did is they analyzed the guano. They wanted to find out about the fertilizer quality of the guano. So I work at UF, obviously, and then what we can do is we can have the, the fertilizer potential of the guano analyzed by the soil lab. So we sent a nice a few bags of guano. <laughs> by the way, that's normal. That's like a Monday for me, okay? <laughs> I've had, uh, coming to any other job, I think, you go to your work and you have bags of poop laying on your desk, that might not be a good sign, but in my line of work, it's like a Monday, okay? So um, they brought it to my office, and then I packaged it up, and we sent it to Gainesville, and the sample tested as a low-grade fertilizer. So essentially what's happening is they're out there eating a lot of the insects at night, not really a lot of the mosquitoes, because that was one of the misconceptions, but they're eating other insects, which potentially could be crop pests and so forth. And um, one of the other interesting things that I, I thought, there is um, the Belcher Canal right there. So you've got the bats living over the canal with all the guano going down into the water. How does that really contribute? You know, how many bridges do bats live in that might have water going to the Indian River Lagoon? You know, do they contribute in any way, shape, or form to the nitrogen and phosphorus that's getting into the estuary? So I have all these research questions that I would like to follow up with, but uh, who knows when I'll have time for that. So essentially what they found is that um, the nitrogen equivalent is about 120 pounds per ton. Um, phosphorus is about 62 pounds per ton, and potassium is about 15 pounds per ton. So they, they found it to be a, a low-grade fertilizer. So what you're going to do if you're ever going to use the back guano, you want to make sure you're wearing a cup-style mask because, you know, we talked about rabies. There are other diseases you can get from this, just the aerosol of having the guano aerosolize in a bag, and you open it and it pops it open. So you want to protect yourself, but you would compost it first, and then you would amend it into your soil. And you compost it first because you don't want anything green. Uh, you want to completely decompose before you put it into your soil. So that's probably more than you ever wanted to know about bat guano. Yeah. And back when Kmart used to be down in Port St. Lucie, we, they were living in the Village Green Shopping Center over there, and we were going to put a bat house up over there, and some of the bat people were going to do that kind of fell through but um it, it's been kind of an interesting thing over these last years dealing with bats so if you're a child stella luna is kind of like a given for those of us that are parents or have nieces and nephews and, and that getting stella luna they will love that stella luna book um, i also like the florida's fabulous series you've got florida's fabulous mammals you've also got it for um, reptiles and amphibians um, the thing about being somebody who's studying reptiles in St. Lucie County, reptiles and amphibians, is we have so many invasive things coming in now that there's a lot of stuff that's off the books. So you might have this book that's showing the natives, but it won't ever show the agamas, the red-headed lizards that are crawling around all over. It won't show the curly tails. It'll show the stuff that should be out there with maybe one or two pages of the invasive stuff. So this is the UF Bat House. This is in Gainesville. And so they had a problem with the bats in one of the buildings on campus. And they built this bat house, and they had to kind of cordon it off so people aren't gonna go underneath that. If you look over here to this side, I'm not sure if it's east, west, or whatever, if you're looking at it to your right, the student gardens are there. So for a small amount, like $20 a year or something, uh, the students can get a small plot of land, and they can farm their crops on that land right next to the bat house, which I thought was kind of really nice. And they have about 300,000 um, Brazilian free tail bats living in there, and also uh, evening bats and the southern myotis. So I have this video clip. We'll see if this works. I went out there right before it got dark out, and I took these video clips. One of the interesting things about this is you'll have the owls and the hawks hanging out right by this.
see. They, they just keep coming. I'm not exactly sure. Probably Mexican free tail, but I'm not 100% sure. We have a slightly different type of bat here. They, they just, they, yep, they just keep coming. So I'm going to stop this. So what was happening before the bats started coming out? Okay, have you guys heard, uh, the kids are probably going have you heard of that new emotion called hangry? You're hangry, you know? What is that? That's, that was an emotion that did not evolve, it evolved until this generation came up. But it's a combination of being so hungry you're angry, that's called hangry, you know? Well, there was a red-shouldered hawk that was hanging out at the tip of that bat house, and it was a hangry hawk. So what was happening, it was about five o'clock in the wintertime, what was happening is he was going from the top underneath the bottom where the, bat, the bats are coming out of the bottom, and he was banging on this, like, dinner, I'm hungry, come, I'm, it's dinner, I'm hangry, come out now. And uh, he just kept hanging around, he kept doing this dance from the top to the bottom to the top again. And then you saw where all the bats were streaming out. So what they do is they stream out from the bat house all the way um, to, they make a break to the trees there, and then they go um, to, to one of the lakes that's across the street, and then they all kind of disperse from there. And they do have the mosquito weeders up in that general area. So, um, so that is the UF bat house. It's really interesting. They've got bleachers up there. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get my PowerPoint back here. Let's see here. I was almost finished anyhow. Yeah. So these are... So the fact about that bat colony, uh, the bat colony, so they put up two of them, there were about 300,000 in the one, and then they built the other one next to it. Now, the one that's up there had the bottom actually collapse out of it. So they, I think they did a repair job on it, and they built the second one, and now they have about 750,000 bats in there. Uh, nightly insect consumption is about 2.5 billion insects. So 2,500 pounds. I can't even imagine what that would look like. I mean, you would fill this room up with the number of insects that they would be eating. And the type of insects they consume, moths, beetles, mosquitoes, flies, gnats, and so forth. So, I mean, these are the good guys to have around us. Um, it's just, unfortunately, down here, I wish we had the mosquito eaters for mosquito control purposes. You know, when we had Zika popping up last year, I would have loved to have been, you know, asking people to put bat houses up. It's just we don't have the right kind of bat here for it. So, uh...